Sunday morning before last, Luke took out of our house about 4 o'clock in the morning heading to Texas. Him and all his family r rallied around his sister uh, to support her in her time of need. And um, it was about Thursday, and he drove back Thursday evening, Friday. Took out early Friday morning. And um, sister said that y'all need to head on back to your lives because y'all being here keeps reminding me of why you're here. You know, the loss of a child. Well, anyway, when Luke gets back and I say to him, I often wondered what empty nest syndrome felt like. He had been there just long enough to get used to this guy. In fact, the waitress didn't realize how much it hurt, but she said, uh, this was said uh, the other day, she said, where's little Larry? <laughs> really, that didn't help a bit. But So I, I said to him, now I need to have a report every week because if I don't start my sermons letting them know what you're up to, I will have not had a complete sermon. And he says, now that's empty nest syndrome. <laughs> But he is at Pensacola today, one of the three students that came down from Southern to work in as uh, this program. His friend is over in Pensacola speaking today, so he went over there and uh, in anticipating uh, being with his friend, and then this afternoon he's going up to College Dell. So you guys, you just have to connect with him from here on. I can't do this every Sabbath, okay? But uh, we've been thoroughly blessed having him here. And for those that have been a part of our church service, whether it be Vespers or anything for the past month, we have been focusing a lot on prayer. Today we're going to continue that with the hopes that even you might grasp just what could be the, uh, the accomplishment of it. What, to what extent could I anticipate the results of prayer being? So let me begin with a word of prayer. Father, we humbly come before you in an attitude of prayer. Because of the silence right now, my prayer is that you are hearing that we are reverently before the throne. We're asking for you to be our teacher. We're asking that we absorb the word of life today in such a way that it becomes so basic, so simple, that something that probably in our own, every mind here, we elude it, and we, we kind of uh, hide away from the subject sometimes. But we're asking for you to teach us to embrace what we can claim through prayer today is our prayer in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I asked the Sabbath school class a question, and every once in a while you ask uh, the Sabbath school class a question, and the class is silent. You would think everybody there would just say, yes, you know, they all raise their hand, but I think they, some questions are so simple they think there's got to be a trick. Uh, like a few Sabbaths back, how many of you would like to have the character of Jesus in you? Everybody was silent, like, is, is, what's the catch, you know? And today was the question, do you believe you are a child of the king? You sure? Okay. So we today should be claiming everything that we have the rights to claim as being his child. It's hard to believe those words as I'm repeating my last sermon, which was a month ago. We as his children have rights, and we ought to be claiming these rights. So I thought, Luke did a series on prayer, so let's just keep this basic. Keep it simple, right? Okay, let's, I'm trying, okay? So here we go. Let's start in the beginning at the life of Christ... And let's begin claiming what he was taught. Let's open our Bibles 
to the book of um, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And let's consider the story here in Matthew 2, uh, verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, now those ones that had departed was the visitation of the Magi that had come to see the wise men that came to see Jesus. And when they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt to be there until I bring thee, uh, bring thee word. For Herod shall seek the young child to destroy him. How many of you would like to hear a message like that come to your mind? Uh, the Lord say, I would like for you to uproot from Panama City, go across, uh, anyway, you, you got the picture. So the big question today, because the, the desire of this study or what we share is just what prayer life are we talking about here? We're beginning the story talking about Joseph's prayer life. His prayer life wouldn't even exist at all if he just had an angel come to him telling him these things and him saying the next morning, hey, honey, uh, Mary, you wouldn't believe the nightmare I had last night. Right? In other words, he had not established a, a prayer life. He would have poo-pooed this message. But he was in communion with, did I say that okay? Uh, he was in communion with his father in such a way, he responded, believed, acted upon it, and they went to Egypt. The results was saving the life of his son. Could have been even saving the life of his family. Who knows? The point is, it's pretty amazing. Now think out of the box. Because whenever Egypt is referred to in the Bible, it's referring to a nation that does not believe in the God. Egypt believed in we are gods. It's almost the other spectrum Instead of worshiping the God of heaven, they worship the God of man. Built pyramids, anticipating them to come back to life someday or whatever. The thing is, as far as the opposite spectrum of worshiping, that's Egypt. So imagine for a moment, God took his son into the setting of that style of worship. Does that sound out of the norm? If you wanted to raise your child in a healthy environment, would you take them to downtown New York? I'm just throwing out a place. We could have said Las Vegas or a lot of places. You know, would you take them there to grow up in the streets? I don't think so. It wouldn't be your first choice, I would think. Joseph in his communion with his heavenly father. Now think about this. If he had not had communion with God, he wouldn't even have allowed to, himself to marry Mary. He would have put her off, but no, an angel came. Joseph's prayer life was amazing. Now I'm establishing this because not only his prayer life, but Mary's prayer life was amazing. This little boy grew up with parents that taught him prayer. It was their life. It was their way to commune with God, to seek counsel, and to hear counsel. This is the way this little boy grew up. Can you imagine for, with me for just a moment? Taking a little boy across the desert. Taking him across the Red Sea. 
taking him over the same location as the Israelites had gone over, would you have just rode the donkey and said, hmm, a lot of sand out today. Sure is hot. I would tell you right now, you couldn't shut me up telling the stories of how God blessed Israel, taking them to the promised land. How about you? They had visual illustrations around them every single day of the goodness of God, and that little boy was raised up in that. Symbolically, Jesus highly represents Israel coming out of e Egypt and winning. The first group that came out of Egypt all failed but two. Jesus came out of Egypt and won. Highly symbolic. So, this little part of the story about teaching Jesus as a boy of a communion, a life of communion with his father, I can only imagine the depth that he grew up learning that life. To the point, story number two comes into play. Let's turn with Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two. And in this story, um, we'll pick up here in verse 39. <clears throat> Because the child has been dedicated, and uh, they have now returned to Nazareth, and I'm picking up the story after coming back from Egypt. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the peace of God was upon him. Here are all these years wrapped up in the growth of Jesus in one verse. One verse, strong in the spirit. To me, that is telling me he communed with the heavenly father. He had picked up in how to not just make requests, but actually listen for counsel. And with that counsel, he gained wisdom. Wisdom, and that wisdom brought him a grace of God that apparently all his brothers and sisters probably um, <laughs> I've really enjoyed working with the young people in the school. I, it it kind of emphasizes to me personally that verse in Revelation, here is the patience of the saints. But it's fun too, you know? And he, but to think that this young boy was raised up with all his brothers and sisters and he still stayed faithful. That is, in this world today, that is a huge statement for a child to remain faithful. He was such in tune with worshiping God that when he was 12 years old, the story continues here, that at the time of Passover, he had the privilege of going with his parents to Jerusalem. He was so much in tune with his father that it, when it came to being at the sanctuary, he was at home. That was his calling. And he felt at home and comfortable to have deep theological conversations with the teachers of the temple. That shows he's been studying. He's been taught. Can't you imagine with me a moment, all those teachers sitting back and listening to Jesus sharing things, asking them questions, and you see a teacher nudge another teacher. Hey, was he in your class? How did he learn this stuff? Where did he get that principle from? How did he connect that part of that verse in Isaiah with the Messiah. How did he do that? By communion with his father. There was a relationship established continually that when in the sanctuary he was at home. 
it's funny sometimes, but it's not funny to think of his parents heading back home and realizing he's not even among them. And Jesus isn't even concerned about it. He hasn't, he, isn't it funny that the story doesn't refer to Jesus missing the parents? Because when they found him in verse 49, he said to them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Isn't this what you taught me the first 12 years of my life? Why should you think I wouldn't respond to it? This church has been called for such a time as this to respond to our calling. Do you believe you are a child of the king? Are you claiming everything? Jesus was claiming everything and what happened in the next story that we're going to consider because let's go back to Matthew Matthew chapter 3. Jesus comes on the scene where John the Baptist is, and he asked John to baptize. Fulfill all what? To fulfill all righteousness. Another part of his example for us as his children to claim. If we believe that we can die to self and come up with his life in us, that is what he's saying. This is the example for all of mankind in order to fulfill all righteousness. We claim that each and every day of our lives. We might have done it in a big way, openly, at the baptismal pool one day. But we have the privilege of accepting all righteousness daily. And that was his example. In fact, at that time, when he made that commitment, he comes up out of the water, and the Father even calls him, This is my beloved Son. How many of you would like to hear those words said to you today? Well, let's just pretend you just did, okay? This is my child. You have nothing to fear. And Jesus leaves this setting, or let's, we'll flip the coin, and today when you leave church, you're hearing those words. I'm his child. And Jesus hearing, I just heard a voice from heaven saying, I'm his son. And he keeps hearing it over and over again. And we keep hearing it over and over again. And pretty soon we realize, there's nothing can separate me from my father. Nothing can. So after 40 days takes place, because in, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse... Uh, two, and when he had fasted 70, uh, 40 days and nights, he was afterward hungry. By the way, there's fellowship lunch today, okay? And when the tempter came to him, he said, this is super important. I'm just going to say three words here because this is what the main temptation is all about. If thou be... If thou be the Son of God, you're going to be tempted this afternoon. In fact, it may even be already happening right at this very moment. The temptation is to place the question in your mouth, in your, mouth, in your mind, whether you are a child of the King. Are you or are you not? You are. You're claiming it. Jesus was claiming it. How he responded to this temptation is to quote Scripture, the very things that his parents taught him. He repeated truth. He repeated the principle, I claim the Word of God as foundational. Nothing can that change. And my God said the words, I am his son, and you can't change that. Is that basic? That's basic. 
Why would I? I want to be, you to hear today. The plan is so basic that you hunger for a very special prayer life. That you constantly commune with Him in such a way you don't doubt any temptation coming from the old devil. Because, hmm, here's the challenge. This is the big challenge. Where do you see victory? Where do you understand victory should take place? At what point in your relationship, in your walk, in your experience, do you claim victory? Now, victory could be considered that, let's say that, uh, let's say something that's not obvious. Your husband, uh, Becky, your husband likes to steal, and, and, um, I just, I cannot resist those mounds bars that are at the exit sign, the exit area of Walmart. That sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. Do, but then I come to the realization that I shouldn't be doing that anymore, right? Hallelujah. Now, where do you see victory? I, I hear a, a voice in the wilderness. Before the temptation should be the victory, just because I've still got a pocket full of mounds bars doesn't mean I'm victorious. And I'm saying, well, I'm sorry I, got the, I took these mound bars. I should be taking the mounds bar back, right? But my point is victory is before temptation. Or we could even say during temptation. Because once we realize we're being tempted, our response should be his response. Claiming the word of God, I am a child of the king, and you need not tempt me over this issue, whatever you want to call, call it, okay? True victory, true victory is at the temptation level. Jesus started his ministry there. Do I need to say that one again? Jesus started his ministry believing that every single temptation cast upon him by the devil, he was claiming victory. Do you believe you're his child today? Do you believe that he can instill victory in your life daily? So, if I was to sit down right now and say, I sure do hope that the church heard good news, I'd be fooling myself. Now, victory's a, a big deal, right? I mean, I don't have any more mounds bars in my pockets. Victory's a big deal. But the reality is, if I sat down there could be a possibility that the same thing that happened in the Dothan, Alabama, Seventh-day Adventist Church this week could happen at the Panama City Seventh-day Adventist Church this week. Wednesday evening, family comes back from prayer meeting. They find their 18-year-old son's keys on the counter, his wallet, his car is in the driveway, but they don't find the son. 18-year-old young man, just committed to be a leader in Pathfinders. Everybody loves this boy. They call the police. Missing persons. Well, I'm sorry, but you can't do it this way. It has to be 72 hours. Because it doesn't look like there's any foul play. The young man was found a short time later, 200 yards from the house. And he had taken his own life. One of his friends found him. 
The message of victory can be instilled in such a way that it places such a burden on us that we think, I, I can't do it. Now, I could respond to that if said, and because I'm claiming the fact it's not me doing it anyway. But that doesn't mean a young mind is grasping that clearly. So I must, I believe, help. There's a book called Romans that goes into great detail explaining. You know, if you're just, if you're a sinner, if you're ungodly, if you're wretched, miserable, blind, poor, naked, he's there for you. There's so many things offered to us through God. All of heaven is being offered to you. But all of those characteristics that is pointing out who we really are as a human being, we're all sick. But as Paul in the book of Romans goes and explains that, it's way over into chapter 8, verse 1. Let's turn there. I'm not going to just attempt to quote it. Let's turn there. Romans 8, 1. And I know that a lot of you say, Pastor, you ought to have that memorized. I've got that memorized. Well, I hope everybody does after today. Romans 8, verse 1, because there's a whole lot of talking about the plan of salvation that's actually already discussed in the first seven chapters of this book. And you come to Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, I want that verse to ring in your mind today because we all sin. We all fall short. But I have to ask you to please remember that what we're being offered in Christ is complete victory. He's preparing this remnant group to go to heaven without tasting death. But yet there's a hope because tomorrow a situation is going to come up and you just might get frustrated. I heard a strong, hmm. We don't anticipate it, but we are in this world. We're a part of Egypt. We're a part of a world that focuses on self and everything to do with self. We are, we've created our own gods. But he is faithful. And with us claiming the life of Jesus, we can be victorious over sin. I heard this illustration many years ago, praise God, that I considered occasionally. Whenever you're tempted, you're most likely being tempted over something Satan knows, I got a chance to trip him up on this point. Y'all with me on that? Okay. So when he's tempting you, He's thinking, oh, Larry, he's, he's messed up so many times on this point. This will be an easy one here, you know. But when I hear that temptation coming and I start saying, wait a minute, I've been here, done this before. I'm making a choice. Lord, you have already prepared a way of escape from this. And I'm claiming as your son, you have prepared a way because I'm your son. I'm your child for eternity. So, Father, Heavenly Father, show me the way of escape. This gets pretty cool because 
Satan, when he comes to tempt you, he loves tempting you in what areas? The ones he has a strong possibility. I'm going to get him on this one. Somebody pulled in front of him in traffic. Do I see if he's a, a tourist in camouflage with a family tag, a Florida tag? Have y'all ever heard that phrase before? Tourist in disguise, they got a, fa- a Florida tag. Never mind. Or an out-of-state person, you know, they're, they're tourists. They, they weren't watching the traffic or something. You, got, you can always make excuses for somebody who pulls in front of you. Anyway, he knows he can get you. He's going to get you frustrated or something. But the thing is, if we, how we respond to that frustration or that temptation will start telling him, Satan, okay, start telling him, I'm getting frustrated with this guy. He's not responding to my temptations. So I'd much rather make Satan mad than me get mad. Right? So the thing is, as your life develops and you draw closer and closer to him, isn't it neat to consider this thought? Satan comes to you and he, or he's, he has an evil angel sent Hound that guy. Do this. Do this. Try to, try to get him. And, and they come in and say, well, we've tried this. We've tried this. We've tried this. Hmm. Satan, this is getting pretty frustrating trying to figure out how to trip this guy up. What, what, do, you, what do you think I need to do today? How close is your journey with your father? How close is your prayer life with him? How close is your victory. Are they victory that you have I've wrestled through today and I finally made it over whatever? Oh, it's a one other mounds bar. Acts of the Apostles, page 53. This is what Jesus was telling the disciples in between the resurrection and when he left. The Spirit will take the things of God and stamp them on thy soul. Let me repeat that one more time. The Spirit will take the things of God and stamp them on the soul. Isn't that beautiful? It's almost like He's saying, I'm sealing you. I can do this. You need not worry about anything. Anything. Listen to this next sentence. By his power, the way of life. The apostles were known that they were the ones that taught the way. The way of life. That life is the life of Jesus. So, By his power, the way of life, it's so plain. None need air. None need air therein. None need sin therein. None need mounds bars. (laughs) None needs the old way. Because Jesus presents a new way, and we're talking about complete victory every time Satan tempts. But if we do, we must never forget we are his child, and there is no condemnation. I have often wondered what it would be like to raise a child. To always encourage. To never belittle. To always affirm, you're my son, you're my daughter. I have the distinct privilege as the pastor of this church 
to do that very thing with little ones when they come to school. The even more exciting as the pastor of this church, I have the privilege of reminding you today that as his child, you have nothing to fear. Our closing hymn is hymn number 334, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing. Please stand to sing it together. Father, we're all prone to wander. We can feel it. Father, we're prone to doubt and to, and to get scared and worried. Please forgive us. Please be with the Dothan Church today. Amen. May no one prone to wander but may they hear good news. May we all hear good news that you can take our heart and take it and seal it. Father, seal us for thy courts above is our prayer. Amen.